Good morning. Welcome to all those few who are here and to all of you who are there uh, worshiping with us online. It is a privilege to have you as part of the Blowing Rock Methodist community. We thank you for being here. Uh, if you have friends who are members of other churches and they watch their home church uh, online at this hour on Sunday mornings, tell them at 5 o'clock this afternoon to go to our website and they can see this service then. Uh, spread the word about who we are and what we're doing uh, and we uh, welcome you and any you might bring to our community of faith. Beautiful flowers today. They're given to the glory of God by Melinda Morton in honor of her husband Gordon uh, in celebration of his 77th birthday this coming Friday. So Gordon, happy birthday. Again, welcome to one and all. We are so glad that you are with us. Good morning. Welcome everybody to Blowing Rock Methodist Church. We are going to give you about 15, 10, 15 minutes of our hymn sing. We do love to sing for about a good half an hour when we're back in our regular services, if you can believe it, a full half hour. Um, and hopefully someday soon you'll be back with us and we'll sing together as a family. But while you're at home, why don't you sing along with us? We are going to sing four of our favorite hymns. And I'm going to start with our Cokesbury hymn. Our Cokesbury hymnal, we're going to go to page 121. Now, 121 is the Church in the Wildwood, and we are going to sing just the first and the last verse of Church in the Wildwood. After we sing that, I'm going to introduce you to our musicians. There's a church in the valley by the wildwood. No lovelier spot in the dale. No place is so dear to my childhood as a little brown church in the vale. Oh, come, 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 come to the church in the wildwood. Oh, come to the church in the vale. No spot is so dear. Childhood as a little brown church in the vale. From the church in the valley by the wildwood, when day fades away into night, I would fade from the spot of my childhood, wing my way to the mansions of light. Oh, come. Come, 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 come to the church in the wildwood. Oh, come to the church in the vale. No spot is so dear to my childhood as a little brown church in the vale. Nice job, everybody. Now, one of the great things about being in a difficult time is trying to find the positive parts of it. And one of the positive parts we have had is that our Holly Lacey now is doing these beautiful preludes for us. And as many years as she's been with us, she hasn't done preludes. So we're so excited to hear those in the morning as a way to start our worship. And so we have Holly Lacey on organ and piano. This morning we have Matthew Prim. He is viola and singing tenor for us. And we have two wonderful musicians here with us. Now we are doing a rotating base of our musicians. Um, and Madeline and JJ will be back again with us. But we have today, we have Madeline Hamrick with us singing soprano. And J.J. Robinson, who's studying right now at Appalachian, is our bass this morning. So we have a special offering for you today. We will sing it for you a little later, but we're excited to continue with our hymn sing. Let's go. If you have a Cokesbury, we're going to go to page 64, and this is Blessed Assurance. And the way that I know you all sing this one, I think plenty of you are going to need to, you know this one without even having to look. You know this one so well. Let's sing Blessed Assurance, the first and last verse, 1 and 3, on page 64 if you're following along in your Cokesbury. Blessed assurance, Jesus is
Coke Sperry and go to what, what we call our big book, also known as the United Methodist Hymnal. We're going to go to page 529. 529, this one is How Firm a Foundation. And I like this one so much, and I know that you like it too. So we're going to do three verses of this one. So we're going to sing on page two, 529. I'd like to sing the first, the second, and guess what? Not the last one, but the fourth verse. So we're going to sing one, two, and four of 529. And I want to give you one little hint. So if you're watching us on the live stream, if you go to the right side of your screen, you've got two things that you can look at. The bottom left, or excuse me, bottom right, you'll see the word notes. If you click on that, you can see the bulletin and follow our order of worship. Up on the top where it says bulletin, if you click on that, you can see the whole order of worship, but then we're going to disappear. So you choose. Maybe you don't want to look at us. You just want to look at the order of worship. But if you click notes, you can see us and the order of worship as well. If you're on Facebook, you're not going to have those to see. So maybe next time you want to click the live stream so you can have the uh, order of worship as well. If you are following on Facebook, um, you know, go ahead and share it so that your friends and family can follow along and see the service at a different time. And remember to like us and follow us, and that way we'll always end up in your stream for Facebook. So those are just a couple of little housekeeping tips that will help you follow along in the service. Again, 529, we're going to do one, two, and four. job singing with us this morning. I hope that you're at home praising the Lord. If you don't have those hymnals, get on Amazon and get them yourself. I'd love to know that you have your hymnals at home. And if not, you can go back and practice with us too. But you're just doing a great job. Be sure that you're singing at home so that when you're back with us in this congregation, you sing out loud and strong. We have one more today. We're going to sing number 77. This is How Great Thou Art. We're going to stick with the first and last verse. Thank you again for joining us in song. Again, page 77, one and four.
Thank you for the music, those who let it hear, those who sing at home, and the spirit that you uh, engender within us of praise and joy and worship. Thank you. Thank you. May we continue now in a spirit of prayer. Let us pray together. O loving Lord, who knows our wounds who loves us in spite of our failings, and who cares for our cares. We bring to you this morning our lives and loves and losses, our faith and frailty and fear, our happiness and hopes and hurts, placing all that we are and are not before the presence of your gracious love. Daily, of course, We pray for our world and its leaders and its brokenness and its beauty and the dream that we might rise above partisan pettiness and become mature and patriotic in the true sense of the word. And we would not cease those prayers. But for this day, we pray to you a different sort of prayer, a prayer for individuals who struggle or suffer and need your power and your peace. I do not know who may be worshiping with us online today, O God, but this much I do know. Some of them are weary, feeling that their lives are uphill battles. Some are suffering illness, dealing with a variety of symptoms, frightened about possible outcomes. Some are lonely, for whatever reason, experiencing isolation or a sense of being misunderstood or ignored. Some are wrestling with grief, having said goodbyes they were not prepared to say. Some are caregivers, spending themselves daily in providing for the needs of others and feeling increasing sense of fatigue when their own needs are relegated to back burners. Some are facing financial hardships, stressed out as they wonder how on earth their bills can ever be paid. Some are dealing with the inevitable issues of aging, some with the reality of depression, some with guilt, some with doubts about their own self-worth. I pray this morning for all of them, for all of us, your children, who bring our brokenness to you, our hurts and hardships, our fatigue and fear, our longing for relief alongside our inability to provide it for ourselves. And I ask, O God, that you will strengthen us. Grant us the grace of your presence in which there is power to rise above the nagging issues of any moment. Grant us a divine shoulder to lean on, a holy ear to listen, and eternal arms to draw us close in comfort. Grant us the knowledge that every day and every moment you are near and we are not alone. Just give us that much, O God, and we will be able once again to take up our crosses and move forward. I pray today that all who worship with us may hear again your promise. Lo, I am with you. Always. This we pray in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray when he said, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. for me to imagine week by week that much sound comes from four voices and uh, on the other hand I spend so much time training those voices that that's uh, that's really beautiful thank you thank you all I failed to mention earlier but uh, we sometimes say these pocket crosses this is the symbol the most famous symbol of the love of Christ 
uh, we have these in abundance. Herb Thomas is gracious enough to provide these to the church in order that we can give them to you if you wish. And we've got hundreds of these. So if you'd like one, if you'd like 10, if you'd like 110, let us know and we'll get them to you. Um, this symbol of the love of Christ. Another symbol of the love of Christ is what we do for our neighbors in the world, and your gifts and offerings enable us to do what needs to be done. We support numerous agencies in the high country that are life-giving and life-transforming and life-supporting, and in this particular moment of history are struggling. Uh, one, for example, has had to scale back so much that the ministry as we knew it almost no longer exists, and they are awaiting renewed resources to, to resume meeting these the plethora of needs out there. Other agencies are dealing with um, folks who have no place to sleep, and folks who have nothing to eat, and folks who have no way to take care of their children. So help us reveal the love of Christ, if you would. Uh, by helping them do their work. Uh, on our website, you can find a donate button, icon, whatever it's called. What's it called, Bill? Button. Huh? Button. But, button. I'll just button. Uh, but it will instruct you. If you go there, it will instruct you on how to make your donation to our church uh, so that we can uh, share your love with those who are seeking to serve others. Please do that for us, we pray. Uh, and let us pray together. God, we thank you for all the gifts you provide to our lives. Use us as faithful conduits through whom you provide to others. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Let me share with you just a couple of verses from the fifth chapter of Paul's letter to the Galatians. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, kindness, goodness, gentleness, patience, self-control, faithfulness. Against such there is no law. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. O oh God, may we hear your word, and may your timeless word become timely for our lives, in our world, in this moment. We ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. I have a friend down in the eastern part of North Carolina, and over the past, I don't know, 15 years, we've probably had lunch together 20 times. And every time, every single time, he orders a hamburger with fries and extra ketchup. And every time, every single time, as he puts a lot of ketchup onto a lot of fries, he will make the same joke. He will say, this is health food, you know, because potatoes are root vegetables, and tomatoes are actually fruits. Therefore, I am having root vegetables and a fruit smoothie. And neither his wife nor his cardiologist see the humor in it. Paul, writing to the Galatians, talked about fruit. He didn't talk about fruit smoothies, to be sure, nor did he talk about weird fruits like tomatoes that I'm convinced down in my heart actually are vegetables. Nor did he even talk about normal fruits like apples and peaches. Paul talks about fruits of the Spirit, the fruits that we should see hanging from the limbs of anyone who is a Christian. The, the characteristics, the attributes that should be apparent in the life of anyone who is Christ-like. And remember last Sunday, we said the definition of the word Christians is those who are like Christ. So, if we are Christian, what should people be able to see when they look at our lives? Well, as you listen to this lesson, Paul mentions nine fruits of the Spirit, and they fall, I think, rather naturally within three categories. So let's take a look. First of all, he said, now the fruits of the Spirit are love, joy, peace. And those, I think, fall under the heading of attitudes. Uh, what is your attitude toward life, your philosophy of life, your worldview, your perspective? Uh, how is it that I view the world and my neighbor and myself? Because the simple truth is your attitude will determine the quality of your life. That's why Martin Luther King said, I choose love because hatred and bitterness are too heavy a burden to bear. Lord knows he had ample reason to choose hatred and bitterness and lust for revenge had he chosen but he knew better. He knew the teachings of Jesus and how Jesus said, this one thing is my commandment, that you love one another. Why? Because only when we look at life through the lens of love can we ever find peace, one of the fruits of the Spirit. Anger and peace cannot exist within the same person at the same moment. Only when we look at life through the lens of love can we find joy because hatred and happiness are incompatible. They are mutually exclusive. Only when we look at life primarily through the lens of love can we find authentic life at all. Your attitude determines the quality of life. Of your life. But now we're finding through medical research 
that your attitude may even affect the quantity of your life. Uh, Everyday Health released a, a study recently uh, that compiled data from major medical centers in America, including Mayo Clinic, Johns Hopkins, and numerous other medical centers uh, of that ilk. And they had studied the physical impact of negative emotions. What do negative emotions do to your body? And particularly, they focus here, but particularly, what does it do to a person's physical well-being when, and you know folks like this, every time you meet them, if you talk for more than a minute, they'll, they'll tell you what they're livid about today, who they're mad at, what they're mad about. So this, this medical study, what is the impact on your body of negativity, especially anger? And I'm going to read it to you. It's very brief, but I want to make sure I don't leave anything out. Everyday Health links a negative worldview, especially anger, to cardiovascular disease, strokes, immune system disorders, arthritis, inflammation in the lungs affecting your air capacity, insomnia, ulcers, migraines, anxiety, depression, and statistically proven reduced life expectancy. Not only, apparently, does our attitude impact the quality of our life, it can impact the quantity of our life. I choose love because hatred and bitterness are just too great a burden to bear. What's your attitude, your worldview? Through what lens do you choose? And it is a choice we get to make. Do you choose to see the world around you? Because our attitude affects both the quality and apparently the quantity of our days. Now the fruits of the Spirit, says Paul, are kindness, goodness, and gentleness. If love, peace, and joy are attitudes, kindness, goodness, and gentleness are actions that result from those attitudes. And I suppose all of us, if we're Christ-like or want to be, would confess that we hope to be good people. I mean, we want to be remembered that way. We want folks, when they talk about us, to say, yeah, he's kind, she's gentle. It's a good human being. You know what I think is the hardest part of that, the single hardest aspect of being kind, good, or gentle? And this is just me. It may be something else entirely to you, and that's fine. But to me, it's the ability to forgive. That, to me, is the single toughest aspect of living a gentle, good, and kind life. Somebody hurts us, and later on, he apologizes. Or she makes an overture. Can we talk it through? Can we patch things up? Am I willing to let go of the resentment and provide an opportunity for a restored relationship to heal the brokenness? Can I let go of the negative adrenaline that I get? Forgiveness, it's a tough thing. This is tougher. This is tougher. What about when he does not apologize? What about when she does not make the overture to say, can we talk it through? Can we patch it up? What about the person who has hurt us and they show no remorse and no regret and they don't seem to think they did anything wrong or if they did, they don't seem to care. You hurt me. So, what's that to me? You don't matter in my life. You Get over it. Can I forgive that person? Someone would say, you know, why should I? Why should I? They're not sorry. They didn't apologize. Why would I forgive them? Because it's not about them. You and I only live for a certain amount of time, and it rushes by. Remember a few weeks ago, we talked about limited shelf space, and we get to decide what to put on the shelves of our emotional makeup, and for every ounce of anger, I lose an ounce of joy. 
We deserve more. We deserve something gratifying, which can't be there if we refuse to forgive, which is why Tony Robbins said some years ago, forgiveness is not a gift you give to the other person. It is instead the most important gift you will ever give to yourself. Jesus understood that. I think that's why he said you shall forgive not seven times, but 70 times seven, meaning infinitely. If you're on your way to the temple and you remember you're at odds with your sister or your brother, first go and make things right so that when you get to the temple, you can find the peace and joy that is provided there. Years ago, I had a conversation with a woman in in the study at the church where I was serving then. And she kind of told me her life story, which in some ways was inspiring, but part of it was just horrifying. She told me about abuse that she had suffered at the hands of a male relative, a member of her family, for years when she was small, from her childhood into her early teen years. He had abused her in a a way that's indescribable and indefensible. At last she grew up and he grew old. And she moved on with a very noble life. And I said to her when she told me the story, how how have you handled that? How have you become who you are? How have you dealt with all of that hurt and resentment that has to be there? And she said almost casually, oh, I forgave him. And I I was really impressed by that. It sounded almost biblical the way she put it. And I said to her, you know... I've got to commend you. There are a whole lot of people, really good people, who could not have done that for him. And she said, Michael, I didn't do it for him. I did it for me. I knew that until I at last purged myself of the anger and the resentment I carried around, I would never be freed from him. And I deserve a better life than that. So I forgave him. That's what Tony Robbins was getting at. That's what Jesus was getting at. Forgiveness is not something we do for the other person. They may not ask for it. They may not desire it. They may not even think they need it. That's not the point. Forgiveness may be the greatest gift we ever give to ourselves. Now, the fruits of the Spirit are kindness, goodness, gentleness. You can list a whole litany of of things, actions that fall under there. And they're all valid. It's just in my own life, I always felt like if I can pull forgiveness off, if I can manage that one, then whatever the others are, I know I can do them too. Because this one for me is the hardest Now, the fruits of the Spirit are love, joy, peace, kindness, goodness, gentleness, patience, and self-control. Can we control the urge to be so busy, so rushed, so involved in whatever whatever it is that demands our time and attention uh, that we don't make room for people? Can I be patient enough? to be open to others. Those first uh, attributes, fruits of the Spirit, those are attitudes. Second, actions. Third, access. Can I make myself accessible to people? Do I have that much self-control? Can I exercise that much patience to be present for people when there are other things I need to do and other places I need to be. And not just for people, not just for good, fun people like you, but what about for that person who gets on our last nerve? It's not that we don't like them. It's not that we wish them ill. It's just that they wear us out. They're always there And every one of you knows somebody like that. They're always there. They're always needy. No matter what you do for them, they need a little bit more. No matter how long you listen to them, they're not quite finished. God forbid you ever say, how are you? Because they will tell you 
and they'll go on and on and on. How much self-control does it take to make yourself accessible to that person? That person who, it's like, like turning a nozzle and draining every ounce of energy out of your life. Can I be patient with them? The late Peter Gomes was brilliant, one of America's greatest preachers. He served at Harvard University for many years, preached in the chapel there. My life was blessed getting to know him. When I was at Centenary Church down in Winston-Salem, I had Peter come and preach for us there. Our, our folks were just blown away by how great he was. I had him scheduled to come preach for us at Marble Collegiate, but he was suddenly taken ill and subsequently died, and our people there were cheated out of hearing him. What a great, great man. And when he preached for us down at Winston-Salem, I remember he told a story about a guy who was always on campus at Harvard. Every single day you would see him, midlife, late 40s, uh, bedraggled and disheveled and just, you know, looking a mess all the time, talking to himself, looking out everywhere as if there were things there. And he said he was one of those people that if you made eye contact, he was on you. That was an invitation to engage, and he would begin talking. And he said, if I were walking across campus, it made no difference if I were in a hurry, where I had to go, what I had to do, how far I had to walk. If I were walking a mile or a mile and a half, he would be stride by stride, step by step, the whole way. And if somebody came up and needed to speak, he would stop them and say, no, we're involved in an important conversation. And the important conversation was always about a UFO that he had seen that week, or he had been beamed aboard, or this world secret government organization that was somehow in capturing us all, or the fact that the dorms now had listening devices where that organization could hear everything you said and everything you did, or how that particular fraternity wasn't really populated by students, but they were members of the CIA. And, and, he, and all of these weird conspiracy fantasy things. And Peter Gomes said, when I would go out of the chapel, I would look. And if I saw him, I would go the other way. But if I saw him and he saw me see him, I was dead in the water. And he said, I remember one day I came out of the chapel and I looked and didn't see him. And I looked this way and there were those eyes looking back. And as soon as we made eye contact, he made a beeline on his way to me. I was on my way to a meeting. It was important. I needed to get my thoughts together. I did not have time for this. I did not have patience for this. And, and Dr. Gomes said, as soon as he started making his way toward me, I prayed. He said it wasn't a formal prayer at first. It was just, oh, God. But he said, it's kind of a prayer, isn't it? So I followed it up by saying... <laughs> God, please don't let him be Jesus. <laughs> and that, God, please don't let him be Jesus. But he said, I knew as soon as the words were out of my mouth, that's who he was. That's exactly who he was. How did I know that? Because that's what Jesus said. Whatever you have done unto the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you have done so likewise unto me. And he said, I suddenly knew if I run from him, I run from Jesus. If I'm patient with him, I'm patient with Jesus. If I push him away, I push Jesus away. If I listen to him, I listen to Jesus. Can I treat that man, Dr. Gomes said, with dignity? Can I be patient enough to be maybe the one person in this city who for a moment or two today will treat him as if he still matters? Because I know, he said, whatever I do to him, I'm doing to Jesus. Now, the fruits of the Spirit are patience, self-control. Even with that person who wears us out. What should the world see when they look at someone who's Christ-like, who is Christian? Paul says to the Galatians, they should see love, joy, peace, kindness, goodness, gentleness, 
patience and self-control. And one of you right now is probably saying, wait a minute. Don't pronounce a benediction yet. Far be it from me ever to ask a preacher to go even longer. But you left one out. I listened. There are nine fruits of the Spirit. You dealt with eight. You left out faithfulness. And you're right. Mea culpa. I left out faithfulness. So let's close simply by saying that what Jesus taught in his life was true. What Paul wrote to the Galatians was true. If every single day I seek to live with love, joy, peace, kindness, goodness, gentleness, patience, and self-control, I guess that is what faithfulness looks like. Receive the benediction. May the love, peace, and joy that come from God be yours. May the kindness, goodness, and gentleness of Christ be yours. May the patience and self-control that comes from the Holy Spirit be yours and keep you faithful.